Hi, hello everybody. I think we are currently broadcasting right now. Uh, thank you all for joining us on our first digital bar on the block. Uh, my name is Pat. I'm the CEO managing partner of Iconic. Uh, we've kind of done these events in various cities throughout the world where we just bring uh, people from the crypto and traditional finance communities together, put them in a room, buy the pizza and beer and let them network. Unfortunately, given what has transpired, uh, given the COVID virus, we can no longer have these in-person meetings, which is really unfortunate. This was basically my reason for running Iconic. I just get one drinking day a month. Uh, so we are now going to take this digital. And as such, we've invited a panel to speak with us. And we felt that, of course, given what has transpired uh, in our system lately, it was worthwhile to touch on what the impacts of the COVID virus has been on not not only our crypto markets, but traditional markets as well. Uh, with me, we have some representatives from some of the top crypto companies around the world, and I will give them a second here to introduce themselves before we start diving into some topics. Uh, so perhaps, Jesus, if you would be so kind, uh, introduce us to yourself and into the blog. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Into the Blog. That we're a platform that brings mar uses data science and machine learning to bring uh, market intelligence about crypto assets uh, to the market. Be probably you've seen our analytics insights like Coin Market Cap, Coin Gecko across uh, top exchanges in the uh, in the world. Uh, my background is as a computer scientist, ex distinguished engineer at Microsoft, used to build quant systems and, uh, in Wall Street. I had a background in AI and, and ML, and now I have the opportunity to merge those concepts of my passion for data science and my passion for crypto in a single play, and that's into the block. Welcome. Thank you for having us here. Uh, Josh, if you could please, next. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, my name's Josh Goodbody. I'm the uh, Director of Growth uh, and Institutional Business for Binance. Uh, Binance is, is a very large digital asset ecosystem provider, um, originally founded in, in 2017, uh, spawned out of, of um, a, uh, a room with CZ and his, uh, his, his followers kind of building this really interesting crypto exchange um, and then adding all of these other ecosystem uh, products over, over the last nearly three years now. So we're a young company, but we're growing uh, very fast. We, we are very much kind of global as well. Um, my background uh, is, I think probably out of all of us in the room, I'm the most boring one. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training originally. I spent the last 10 years. I got you beat. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Just I'm, ruined I'm, your entire intro right there. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by uh, law, lawyer by training. So I spent the last kind of 10 years doing financial markets uh, advisory stuff on the sell side and the buy side. So I'm really a traditional finance guy by, by background, but, I fell in love with the crypto space over the last couple of years. So I originally joined as the global GC for, for Huobi Global um, in 2018, uh, and I joined Binance earlier this year. So good to be Wonderful. Thank you for having us here. Um, uh, Vincenzo, if you could please. Yeah, Vincenzo Nicola, co-founder and co-CEO of Conio. Conio is a company started in 2015, five years ago, uh, mainly based in Italy. that allows now banks to offer cryptocurrency services to their customers. So let's say you're a bank customer, like I guess everybody. Usually you open your bank account, your bank app, you see your checking, credit cards, uh, movements, and then you will see also a new button that says Bitcoin. And then you can buy, sell, send, receive, and have safe custody of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies directly into your phone. So we provide these services for the banks that can they, they can like give to their customers. We launched our first bank uh, a couple of weeks ago with 1.2 million customers here in Italy. And we're planning to launch uh, across multiple banks in the next few months. Uh, my background is computer science. I have a master of science uh, in computer science from Stanford University. Worked in Yahoo, worked in Microsoft in Seattle. Uh, Ten years ago, I started also, I, I co-founded a startup in, in mobile payments. So I've been in this space for uh, quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. And we sold the technology to Amazon in 2013. And now it's gone. Ah, fantastic. I hope you're staying safe down there in Italy. Yes, uh, Cameron, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Great to be here, everybody. Uh, my name is Cameron Dickey. I'm head of EMEA sales for B2C2. Uh, we have been around since 2016. We're one of the largest market makers and OTC liquidity providers uh, in the crypto space. We launched the first single dealer platform and fixed connection for crypto uh, back in 2017. I joined the company just in August of last year. 
Uh, my background is, is traditional finance. I actually left university with a law degree, but, but went into broking uh, and then moved into crypto late 2017. So I, uh, I, I've known about the bad times and a bit of the good times. Right, very, very good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. And John, last but not least, if you could introduce us to yourselves and Ontology. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, John is in here. I represent uh, Ontology Business Development Director for Ontology in the European Union. Uh, Ontology is a high performance blockchain open source protocol. We have been around since early 2017 on uh, mainnet and uh, very successfully expanding our business core to the European Union, North America, and uh, other places. Uh, same as Binance, we operate globally uh, on a decentralized manner, such as the technology. Uh, my background is in international business, international politics, and marketing, and also. Uh, creative industries, been in the field for around 10 years so far. And uh, my first crypto trading was in Wen Wealth. I bought a pizza at Room 77 in Berlin with, uh, and ever since I got hooked. So very happy to be here and uh, glad to have you all. It's actually kind of interesting. I started, I mean, I got into crypto because I used to work with the Deutsche Börse, the German stock exchange. And of course we were looking at investing in early stage blockchain companies. Um, back in, God, I think it was maybe January, February 2017, I was actually at Room 77 because one of my crazy crypto friends convinced me to come here and we're all sitting around the table and they're all trying to get into this new ICO. Um, and actually kind of the inspiration for Iconic was when everybody collectively together decided they were going to invest in this ICO solely based on the fact that the managing team of this purported ICO had their LinkedIn pages on the landing page. And that was the whole reason these groups were investing. So I have plenty of experience at Room 77. Um, so perhaps maybe we can just kind of get it kicked off. We're going to try to do something between 35, 40 minutes of questions and leave the last 15 to 20 minutes or so for a Q&A session with our guests that we have in the gallery. Um, so the first question that I kind of have, and John, I'm going to direct this to you. Given everything that's transpired with COVID, everybody is working from home, all international travel has more or less ceased or has been severely limited. For a company like Ontology that's been working to expand internationally, in particular within the EU over the last few months, how has your strategy changed uh, given how uh, the markets have more or less come grinding to a halt? Yeah, it's a very good question. And uh, well, you know, the interesting part of working for a company that promotes decentralized technology is that the core work component is equally decentralized. Therefore, uh, we're very much used to work remotely. So the teams work remotely per se. Uh, the community that supports the chain and the gas of the chain and the token of the chain, actually they work remotely as well. You can call ourselves the third uh, party generation of the 21st century, if you wanna call it, right? Uh, personally, I've been working remotely for at least the last five years. So I'm, I'm very used to it. Now with uh, external partners and third, party, uh, third parties in, in per se, that has been kind of a challenge. I think some companies are finding the common ground on how to work remotely uh, and decentralized. Uh, for that terms, we keep using uh, technology tools which are available out there. Um, and we keep ourselves sane, uh, but it hasn't been such dramatic as uh, probably with other well-established and centralized uh, um, ecosystems. I can certainly imagine. Has anybody else had any uh, different experiences? So perhaps maybe um, either Jesus or uh, Vincenzo. It, maybe if you could touch a little bit on customer acquisition strategies, particularly on the B2B side that your businesses typically engage in. How have the conversations changed? How has the medium of uh, communication changed for your particular businesses as you're still actively looking to expand? So I'm going to provide two, two perspectives on this. One is uh, a CEO of Into the Block and two is an, as an investor on several B2B uh, companies. So mm -hmm. as, as a CEO of Into the Block, our business hasn't been affected. Quite the opposite. We just closed our biggest uh, quarter ever. Uh, we added 15 new customers and Q2 is, is looking very good. So most of our clients are crypto companies, so we're not that exposed to traditional capital markets and everything 
uh, that is going uh, and because crypto is an all digital uh, asset class, most companies in this uh, space are accustomed to do business digitally, it's very global and the dynamics haven't changed. What I, what I have noticed though is that uh, as, as, a, as a CEO of a company or part of a management team, you do the dynamics of how you interact with people have have shifted a little bit. I, I find myself, and I've spoken to to a few CEOs to see if they experience the same, spending more and more time with our internal teams, making sure everybody's focused, everybody's driving. We're in a very chaotic environment. You turn on the TV or the news, and all you're hearing is apocalyptic things like really bad news. So in that environment, people are concerned. They're not focused. They're distracted. So it is hard to uh, to maintain, um, uh, you know, high morale and execute at, at the same speed you were going before, and and that's typically the responsibility of uh, of the management team. Now, on a on a, a different perspective, as an as an investor in several B two B companies, we're, we're seeing pipelines being affected and a lot of deal being shifted one or two quarters down the pipe, and even the companies that are that are doing well, you should. It's a network effect, right? If the global economy is being affected, companies are going to cut spending. They don't know how to plan. There is a lot of uncertainty. So that's a ripple effect that is going to merge through. Venture funding is really difficult. So a lot of companies are going to be affected through, uh, for this. And you should definitely plan, plan for it. Uh, so I know, for instance, with our own portfolio, we have, um, through Iconic Lab, made about 11 or so investments directly. Uh, we've done a substantive amount of work over the last month or two to make sure that this portfolio was able to kind of cover the next six to 12 months of burn for those that are kind of in the growing and the scaling phases. Uh, Vincenzo, your primary clients are banks, financial institutions yeah. themselves. Uh, so a little bit of a different perspective than Jesus working purely in the crypto space, but being a crypto oriented company, but working with a lot of these very distressed financial institutions, are you seeing a little bit of a different perspective there? Yeah, so first let me add something. I mean, we are in Milan, so it's been one of the uh, most hit cities in the world by the coronavirus. Uh, in terms of uh, work-life employees, uh, um, we were a company where everybody worked in local, like in the same, uh, like uh, building the same office. And actually, because I mean, uh, I mean, I know people talk about remote working is great, smart working, but also believe in uh, sweating all together, swearing all together, and getting stuff done all together. And actually, things get faster. And also, the DNA of the company grows faster, especially when you're a startup, small startup. These are the things that uh, provide uh, lots of value. Uh, at the same time, now everybody's remote, all good. I mean, we can still work remotely. The problem is this, that when we want to hire people, especially younger people, junior, mm -hmm. it's harder to train them. And I think this is something that uh, many people forget, that when you want to onboard new people and you're remote, it's not as uh, efficient as if you are next door or uh, uh, next to the person. Talking instead about banks, uh, things are interesting. Uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, like I said, like we just released our first bank integration and we're proud that we've done it under lockdown. So it was actually, I mean, I need to be honest, like I, uh, I need to give kudos to the team and the partner bank, Hype slash Bancasella, because they did it in a very stressful situation. Mm -hmm. um, other banks now are going to, it's very likely that when a bank sees a, a very good work done already in production, uh, they will be interested. It's, like, it's easier to sell to them. Um, at the same time, we see a number of banks that are getting like uh, scared about the situation. For that, not, not talking about like cryptocurrency, because they are very interested in cryptocurrency. We see lots of interest in the space. What we see at the same time, uh, banks are a little worried about their own survival from a certain point of view. So the priority is a little bit shifted, uh, but I believe that once the crisis is over, I mean, things are going to come back to normal and it's going to be like very bright future. Yeah, we can certainly hope so. And I think that is probably going to be the inevitable future. And we'll certainly touch on what our outlook is for traditional markets and crypto as we get to the latter part of this conversation. Um, I actually want to turn it over now to you, Josh. Um, you're relatively new to Binance, I understand, but I would imagine that 
I mean, at the end of the day, Binance is notorious in crypto that everybody works from home. Of course, people probably get together every now and again, but maybe there's some best practices that you can enlighten the rest of us on as to how the company organizes itself in a fully decentralized work from home manner standardly and how that has helped you cope with uh, the work from home enactments given COVID. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, Binance has been quite lucky in, in this respect during this you know, pretty difficult time that as a, as a company, our internal culture is very much geared towards, you know, remote working. We <clears throat> have a fallback position, uh, which is our default position, which is we, we all work remotely. In some cases, we come together in, in co-working spaces. We have shared spaces that we can work from if we want to. But the culture ver is very much kind of tailored towards working remotely. And that's a core part of the ethos. If you can't find the right people to build an organization where you trust each other to execute remotely, you're hiring the wrong people. Um, the caveat is I know that doesn't work for all industries, but for mm. our very much online driven world that we're in, it, it works perfectly. So, you know, what, what do we do that, that other companies don't? I think we have a, a, a real understanding of how to use these kind of collaborative online tools to work together efficiently. So everything that we do is, is very fluid in terms of the conversations we have that can be through different mediums, whether it's Telegram, whether it's our internal, um, internal communication tools, something like a Slack tool that we use, um, or whether it's via, um, you know, video calls that we do. We're always in contact as a team. So we have daily touch are points. Are you using Asana and Trello for project management at any points, or what is the overarching tool that you're using for organization perhaps? Yeah, we use a number of different tools. So the tech teams you'll, you'll tend to see use a combination of Trello. Uh, they might use a Jira-like software yeah. kind of dev prioritization tool. The sales teams will use a different, more CRM-focused tool. Everyone has their flexibility within their unit or within their team to use the right tools they need for their, for their business. Um, so we don't tell anyone in terms of the teams how to, how to work and operate. But what we do is we try and get people to understand how to collaborate across regions, across time zones as quickly as possible. So a Binance induction from day one is very much, these are the tools we use, this is how we use them. This is what we expect from our teams in terms of communication. Everyone needs to be on the same page as far as possible. So even outside of the formal team structures where you have different parallel teams, very much working in different worlds, whether it's the tech team communicating with the PR team, we have this all hands call every single week where people will swap the high level ideas they have, all of the things that's going on in their world and really share that information that sometimes you don't get to see in more traditional organizations. So if I put my hat back on from being a lawyer in a bank or a custodian or, a, or an asset manager, we only really heard about what we were doing within our unit, right? We, we might have heard a little bit about what was happening in a business unit if we were involved with that business unit but we would only once a quarter or once, a, not once every six months in some cases, actually, we don't really hear about what the rest of the company's up to, apart from a few relatively sterile emails that would go out every now and then. So we've taken this approach of getting everybody together um, in a time efficient way, because that's another thing that I'll come on to, getting everyone together in a way that facilitates that information spreading. One of the key things we've noticed that, that companies that are geared towards working remotely kind of get wrong sometimes is time management. There's mm -hmm. this weird misnomer that working remotely means you're not productive. Actually, what we're tending to see now that more people from industries that aren't typically working remotely, we're tending to see them realizing, my God, this is massive for productivity. And now the key challenge is productivity and, and time management. How do you fit everything in when you're in a productive environment working from home? Um, mm -hmm. So for us, management of time is the key thing. So if there's a meeting and there's 30 minutes penciled in, um, let's cover as much as we can in that 30 minutes. And if, if it ends early, if it ends 15 minutes into the meeting, finish the meeting straight away. Give people back their time. And that's a key thing. We want people to be in control of their time, but we want to respect people's time as well. Not perfect. Um, so now I'm going to change gears a little bit. So we've kind of touched how COVID has impacted each and every one of our individual businesses and our work processes. Now I want to actually talk about the market. So Cameron, I'm going to turn this over to you here. Now, from Iconic's perspective, the last time that we had a bar on the block, I was actually in New York City with our managing director, Dominic and Susanna there. We had a wonderful event planned. I think it was on Thursday, March 13th. 
Uh, lo and behold, the night before we have that event, we had 200 plus people showing up. We had representatives from Fidelity, uh, from uh, Genesis Trading, Tom Lee, a fund strat was coming to speak on the panel. And Donald Trump, the night before, goes on television saying flights to Europe are canceled. And at least in my mind, this seemed like the catalyst for the Western world to go, oh shit, COVID is actually something we should be concerned about. Next morning, we wake up to crypto being down 20% overall. And I think by the time that we actually ended up having our event that night, that went from having five, six wonderful speakers to one and 200 plus participants to maybe 10 that actually showed up, crypto had gone down 40 to 60% across the board. Now, you as one of the largest liquidity providers in the world, what do you think was the catalyst for this? And what were you seeing? And what was that day like for you? Well, firstly, th those 10 people that still showed up, I mean, I imagine it was a free bar. Good, good on them for, for still putting in an appearance to your event. You had the best time at that event than any other one because there was so much <laughs> beer and pizza per person. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hey, it, it was a roller coaster ride. Um, you know, spreads um, absolutely blew out. We saw on that Thursday a few of the exchanges breach five percent. We saw ten percent breached on a, on a number of exchanges on the Friday as well. There, there were a number of winners and losers, and that wasn't just from a trading perspective. You know, some firms did very very well, like the liquidity providers, like, like ourselves. You had some record days in a record month. But you also had some trading losers, firms that were heavily exposed to, shall we say, a very famous <clears throat> futures exchange that, that suffered you know, a DDoS attack. And, and that led to you know, cascading liquidations. And interest, just as a side point on that, actually, you know, there's arguments already taking place around the fact that he's, he's, are we in a position where some big exchanges like that are already posing a systemic risk based on what we see happen? throughout the market when, when there is a problem like that. But then you also had reputational winners and losers as well. So like I said, we had some exchanges whose spreads were untradeable, you know, at times as well as exchanges who, who suffered from an attack and, and cascading liquidations that caused huge reputational damage, you know, and you're finding that trying to win back market share when clients have had a, a near fatal, um, experience on those exchanges is extremely problematic. You know, there, there was, um, you know, a number of instances where firms quite simply could not trade. And that's the difference between, you know, you staying afloat and when the market's moving 50%, you know, that's, that's you winding up your fund and, and saying goodbye. Is, there, is it worthwhile to discuss a uh, kill switch um, in crypto? Should we be shutting these exchanges down uh, when these very turbulent times happen? For instance, we have circuit breakers in traditional finance. Is that worth discussing in crypto or does that kind of bastardize the concept of decentralization? Well, I, I would be really surprised if a lot of these firms didn't already have that in place, but they chose not to exercise them. You know, we, we saw a number of our competitors who weren't... Uh, they're not exchanges, but they're huge uh, liquidity providers simply decide to switch off. You know, it's not unique to crypto that you have market makers running for the hills when the going gets tough. You know, I don't think a kill switch is the answer here. I think more robust, um, you know, market systems and controls and a, a more mature market, because let's be honest, we're still a cottage industry compared to, to traditional finance, would mm -hmm. give, um, you know, market participants a little bit more peace of mind. You know, I sat there watching this move. Uh, I mean, it was it was crazy. You know, some of the prices that were being quoted as well were, were just un, just not realistic. You need to have at least you know something resembling accurate two way executable pricing uh, to call yourself any kind of, of asset. You know, if we're really going to be a digital gold or or something that forms part of an overall portfolio, yeah. you know, we can't fall down at the first hurdle, which uh, which oh, we found some of our competitors really? doing. Yeah, Jesus, me, were you doing any interesting analytics uh, or what type of data were you uh, mining within uh, into the block that might shed some light as to what was transpiring here? Yeah, we, we saw a lot of interesting, um, uh, a lot of interesting metrics uh, during uh, during those two days. Uh, what I mean, I, I, I sort of subscribed to the to the thesis that that uh, that day came as close as breaking the foundations of Bitcoin as we ever been in uh, uh, in uh, in this market, uh, so uh, for instance, the uh, we were referring to the spread. So as the spreads were going crazy on exchanges, we we actually monitored the the inventory and the money, the funds coming in and out of exchanges at the blockchain level, and we saw a massive spike, like almost a hundred thousand bitcoins 
being moved uh, in and out of exchanges at that time, which means people were pushing funds into exchanges to liquidate it. So as the price was going up, you will see the inflows are going, are going up uh, as crazy. However, one metric that we found very surprising, I think Coindesk published an article of this about this with our analysis, was that the number of long-term holders for Bitcoin, and we tend to classify that with addresses a whole over a year that are not exchanges, it has continually uh, increased uh, even throughout that time. So people that are playing the long game are still in it and they're not selling and they're not moving funds and that in any market, the people that hold for the long term is a, is a very strong sign of resiliency. So that's one thing. And if I come back, if I can go back to the argument about the circuit breakers, mm -hmm. maybe technically that's not the, the, I'm not sure if that's a solution, but something like that is needed. I mean, that was a highly theoretical mechanism in capital markets. And then it, it became very practical in the 2008, 2009 a crisis and in a market that is as inefficient as crypto is, as small as crypto is, uh, will make it, barely make it in the S&P 500, uh, having a mechanism for controlling those things that many times are macro factors and sometimes are flat out market manipulation. So th those things are, I, I think are, are important. <laughs> It would allow uh, market makers, it would allow uh, exchanges, OTC desks around the world, the opportunity to potentially regroup. Um, at the end of the day, I don't know how this would ever be potentially installed. And perhaps maybe at that point, I would turn it over to you, Josh. So as uh, one of the largest exchanges in the world, how did Binance deal with massive amounts of Bitcoin and other crypto assets uh, coming in? What happened on the liquidity side? What were the spreads that you were observing on Binance? Uh, during this period, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was it was a it was a fascinating day um, in in That's many respects, and, <laughs> and I think yeah, I think you know we, we were watching it in real time, um, and you know, thankfully, what I can say is we've been here as an exchange. You know, we we've we've been in scenarios that are similar, not as not as violent perhaps, but but similar um, as a team. Uh, we've been through this before, um, and. Regardless of that, it was it was challenging. Um, you know, sentiment is a powerful thing. When your users are freaking out uh, about the way the market is moving, you you kind of it, it does affect you. But but we've been there before. We kept cool heads, and we 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 really just kept focus on one thing, and that's keeping keeping our systems up and running, making sure that we are uh, you know providing a positive force within this pretty difficult day, as opposed to adding towards some of the market stress. So, you know would we want to implement a circuit breaker? It's not something, you know, we're currently looking at. Um, but this all comes down to market integrity. You know, if, if, if the market starts working efficiently, um, uh, akin to some of the other markets, the more traditional markets, if, if the market is, is efficient um, and the right structures in place, the right universal frameworks as to how these markets should react in these situations, then circuit breakers aren't, aren't necessarily something that you would want to have in the first place. The difficulty is crypto uh, as a market, as an asset class, has, has really evolved in a rather unusual way outside of, outside of regulatory uh, supervision, outside of common norms and, and well understood structures. It's really been cobbled together in various different regions and it's just grown exponentially and that's led us to the situation we've had where in times of real market stress and volatility, it really puts a strain on some of the some of the systems and the infrastructure providers in ways that you wouldn't anticipate. So, taking that back to to, to Binance, you know, we were lucky on that day. Um, we 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 had prepared carefully in terms of our system resilience, our business continuity plans, making sure, you know, our our ability to scale in terms of, of volumes, in terms of um, the heavy load that was being put on our system was fit for purpose. So we were ready for that. And we kind of, as an organization, had been talking internally about something like this coming for a while. So we've been working on scaling up all manner of aspects on our systems to, to really meet what we thought would be an all-time high in volatility, in, in volumes, um, and of course, make sure that everything works from a, from a deposit, from a withdrawal perspective. Because sentiment, as I said, is a powerful thing. If, if, if a, you know, an, an institution like Binance has an issue on a day that's quite, quite you know, impactful as, as that those two days were or three days were in, in March, P 
people talk. So it's our duty as, an, a, as a system provider and a, and, a, and a platform operator to maintain an orderly market. And we do that by keeping things up and running when the going gets tough. Um, so, you know, it's a day we're not going to forget quickly. Um, but, you know, we're certainly as a firm, we're ready for more days like that. Um, and at the end of the day, we're, you know, we're a market, uh, a market systems provider. We're a, um, a platform operator and it's our job to make sure that, that we are there um, in, in the right format, in the right, in the right state when things get, get as hot as they did in March. Uh, when they're going, it's tough to tough get going, right? And on that note, right. I want to kind of posit this question. Now, one of the overall driving theses, not just behind uh, Bitcoin, which is, of course, the gold standard for this, but other alternative assets in crypto as well, is that they are non-correlated asymmetric assets. I just want to posit this question. Has this narrative died, given that we're starting to see a little bit of a convergence of Bitcoin to traditional markets, or was this a short-term liquidity crisis? Um, Vincenzo, you're the one that's communicating maybe the most with traditional financial players. How are you communicating the value adds of, let's focus on Bitcoin, and then John, I'd like to turn it over to you, uh, the value adds and the value drivers behind one of the uh, more prominent alternative coins, Ontology. Yeah, no, it's such a great question. Uh, as you, as everybody has seen, the markets are very rational, in my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, and I guess actually most of our customers, uh, they are behaving in the right way. So what we see, again, I cannot generalize because I can talk about uh, what we see with our uh, own customers based in Italy. People buy periodically, like a small amount of Bitcoin. Actually, when the price goes down, like it happened, uh, People kept buying. I mean, they don't sell. I mean, of course, there are people who, who in a certain point, they want to sell, but most of them keep buying. And actually, when they see a dip, like it happened, they bought even more. So uh, I don't know if it's actually something about Italy that's different than the rest of the world, or is this actually common? But the thing is, is this, that uh, people see opportunity in Bitcoin. They understand, at least here, that uh, things, uh, you, you get a bump in the road. But when you look at outside, when you see like the Federal Reserve printing money in, in, in an indefinite quantity, or European Union that has no clue what to do, people at the point try to seek refuge in a certain way, in something that still looks safer than other currencies. So from that point of view, I feel like that's been a hiccup and Bitcoin is going to resume its proposition of store value. I mean, we're going to see it very soon, but that's what I believe, and that's what our customers believe. Very good. Uh, so I definitely want to touch on that and open that up for a broader conversation, because I think we can actually have a little bit of a debate here around this. Uh, but before we do so, John, I want to turn it over to you. As Ontology being one of the prominent issuers of an alternative coin, uh, how has the narrative around Ontology perhaps changed, given what's transpired in the marketplace? Um, well, actually, it has changed for positive. And, you know, before I answer that, I want to touch base on the main question in here is that, I, for one, I'm very proud about each one of these companies um, and, and representatives which are here because um, if you will have thought these 10 go in the crypto ecosystem, it will have been unthinkable to have these uh man and brains all together speaking about crypto in such an advanced manner now this is agree to disagree i disagree that you have to regulate crypto as <clears throat> within the established ecosystem you cannot regulate crypto as you regulate stocks or bonds or etns in the on, the on the traditional market so actually crypto is a way out is a plan b to these traditional markets so why you should regulate it on the same way we're figuring out, but at the same time, um, this is not the, you know, I go back to Josh as well. This is not the first time that not only Binance or OKX or other exchanges faces the challenge. This is, this has happened in so many times within the crypto ecosystem that our coin, our token goes down in value 30% one day and it goes off again, 45% the next day. I think, we are very used to these kind of scenarios, right? Um, therefore, ontology, sure, if we speak about the token, yeah, it's very volatile at the moment, but I always go back to the philosophy of a token and that's infrastructure behind, that's blockchain. Now, the technology that we're implementing is based on data, 
um, we are developing the DDX protocol, which is data exchange, advanced data exchange system. And we also work hard on DID, decentralized identity. So after COVID-19, I believe that citizens are going to have a bigger interest when it comes out, not only to cryptocurrencies, but the underlying technology blockchain and then identity as a whole. How can blockchain uh, promote an advance or enhancement in identity? Well, we're, we're working on that. Uh, we want to decentralize the identity. We want to give the identity the right treatment, treat it as a right asset for the 21st century. We're mm -hmm. working on that. But also, I think we are not the ones right now to learn from the traditional industry. Actually, the traditional industry should start learning more about how we roll in the crypto world. We are used to 25%, and but they, they're not. So this is something that is turning and it's changing. Day, right? Yeah. I like to give some spice to the conversation, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. But I really want to hear Cameron on this because uh, as a liquidity provider, this is my kind of a nightmare. Um, again, token, we're doing, we're actually going up, we're raising, uh, we're being traded on all the major exchanges out there. Um, main issue right now, liquidity. Yeah, we have an issue in there, but we have the right components to scale up the technology. Again, mm -hmm. decentralized identity in data exchange. So, uh, so Cameron, what are your general thoughts there? Um, and let's maybe particularly stick around uh, crypto relative traditional markets. Um, now, my hypothesis is that what has definitively been proven is that Bitcoin is not a fully asymmetric non-correlated asset. I think that we started to see a bit of a convergence. However, I'm not necessarily unconvinced that Bitcoin itself is not a, on the whole, uncorrelated asset. I think that what we've seen now is that every single asset in the world during a short-term time span of a liquidity crisis converges on a correlation or an R squared of one. And we certainly saw that in debt, we certainly saw that in equities, and we certainly saw it in Bitcoin. What do we think the outlook for Bitcoin and crypto is, given that we now know that it is not fully uncorrelated, especially in short bursts, but potentially still has that narrative of the safe haven, digital, bold, non-correlated asset class? Sure. So, you know, firstly, we're working off an extremely small data set for crypto relative to other assets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other thing is you, you have to take into account crypto is the most risk on asset across, you know, your major choice of, of assets to invest in, which means when the going gets tough, crypto is the first thing to get liquidated if people then have to cover margin calls elsewhere. So, so immediately during a downturn, you're going to see it's not surprising that you're going to see big, big moves like that. And the I digital gold brigade. So sorry. Great. Oh, I can validate this because, for instance, a lot of the conversations um, our New York office was having with hedge funds that are operating there. And mind you, these are not crypto hedge funds, but more traditional hedge funds that do have a small exposure to Bitcoin. The very first thing they liquidated Thursday morning when they woke up after Trump's announcement that Wednesday night was their Bitcoin position in preparation for meeting their margin calls. No, no trader on Wall Street will get fired for selling Bitcoin. Exactly. So, so, you know, from where it sits within the ecosystem, it, it's always going to be prone to, to those bigger moves or, or more importantly, you know, markets tend to overreact and we simply see that exacerbated in the crypto space. The, the digital gold brigade were, were conspicuous by their, their absence when we saw it do nothing compared to what gold did uh, through that sell-off. The uncorrelated brigade Again, as we saw it correlate for a certain time period, were, were also conspicuous by their absence. I think the outlook is, is more going to form around utilization and general uptake. So you have an ecosystem of people trading Bitcoin and people that think it's a store of value. The next level here is, is something that's going in tandem with what we talk about with regarding stable coins and, and how that... Cameron? eventually that ecosystem and digitalizing currencies bitcoin is essentially you know digital curry 1.0 but it has no day-to-day -day uses you can't you still well apart from you guys in berlin you still can't go to a coffee shop and pay for coffee in in any you know wide sense 
sense. So how, how that shapes up over the coming years is almost a slightly separate situation to what we see in markets where at the moment, you know, you've got quants, HFT firms, and then big exchanges, completely decentralized. Uh, and a large amount of retail flow because the retail flow is still a very, very large part of this market. You know, we are a cottage industry. If Chinese retail decide to sell Bitcoin, you feel that throughout the entire market, you know, and that's a little bit different to, uh, to other asset classes at the moment. But I do think that's going to change. So does anybody else have maybe any contrary thoughts to this? Um, hey, Zeus, for instance, yeah. what is your outlook on the narrative we've been using in Bitcoin for the last couple of years? For instance, Bitcoin began in as a peer-to-peer -peer cashless payment system. It was very uniquely and creatively pivoted in narrative to digital gold and non-correlated asset class. Where do we now go from here? So the, the, I think we're past the payment nar uh, narrative. I think there are very b better vehicles uh, today uh, for that given the volatility and all that. The store of value narrative, it definitely has a lot of potential. I, I think the, um, the, the idea of, uh, of looking for correlations and fantasizing about correlations about traditional capital markets and something as small as crypto, that is uh, the market cap of uh, of one stock in the uh in the s p 500 uh i mean that that's crazy and it's too early and then you want to really measure it in one of the most uncertain crises that we ever had that we don't people don't even know how asset classes that have been studied for decades are, are reacting and, and we're looking at this new thing here uh, so, uh, interestingly enough, if, if we want to go down that path, it has shown some, some interesting non-negative correlation with other things like silver and, and on other uh, commodities that are not that often looked with the small caps. Uh, th there is maybe some, uh, some potential there, but I think the way in which those correlations are going to emerge are, are potentially non-linear it's not going to be as simple as oh my god this one is going to, going up and this one is going down the, the relationships is going to markets are very complex entities and trying to think that we're going to figure that out in an excel spreadsheet to me has always been uh being silly what i what i do agree though is that a crisis like this should contribute in, in, in addition to the fact that we have the bitcoin halving coming up in, in a few uh, in a few weeks and all that, I, I think a, a crisis like this should help to uh, to solidify Bitcoin's position in the market and the original uh, Satoshi's vision. If by the end of all this, uh, Bitcoin is is not a more prevalent asset class in the in in the minds of investors and all that, we probably have a problem. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. So now that we have what effectively could be seen as a perfect storm. Uh, the very next crisis, after the crisis that kind of initiated Bitcoin back in 08, 09, that could really end up driving what Bitcoin's value is. Do, what are our thoughts related to the upcoming halving, as well as all of the money printers around the world, the central banks, bailing out all of their financial institutions, small businesses? I mean, even in the United States, we're going full on uh, UBI by giving $1,200 to every single uh, qualifying citizen. Is this the perfect storm for Bitcoin? Or are we going to still see a little bit more of a, a tepid response to crypto as an asset class through 2020? I'm going to open that to anybody. I'm sure there's actually a lot to unpack here. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a huge amount to unpack. I think, you know, just to finish off the, the, the conversation on, on uh, whether or not crypto or Bitcoin even is a non-correlated asset, um, I think we can, we can theorize around that for, for, for hours and hours. You know, you can find a, a, a convenient graph to draw, you know, a correlation to the price of avocados if you want, and you can say Bitcoin's correlated to avocados. And, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a way of finding madness in madness in, in anything in this market. What for me is, is, is when more. When start coming into Bitcoin, we can say it's correlated to avocados. Uh, yeah, there's some interesting graphs floating around. You should, uh, you should check them out. Um, so what is more interesting for me is, is the long-term viability of, of Bitcoin as, as more than an asset of speculation. And, and that I think is, is something that we're going to increasingly see come to the forefront of public debate and discourse just by virtue of what the hell's going on in all these economies, you know, we are we are taking quantitative easing to 
to the next level. We've got negative interest rates in the US. Um, we're seeing, you know, all kinds of interesting fiscal stimuli being thrown around by governments in absolute and utter desperation. People simply do not know at, at a government level how to deal with this current crisis. And, and that makes the public think, well, if, if, our, if our leaders then understand how to manage the economy in this, in this, in this distressed situation, um, what's going to happen to my cash in the bank? And, and it's, it's been a long time since the public has had to think about the value of my cash in the bank is actually actively depreciating. Not that over the next few years it depreciates a little bit. Yeah. Most people now more or less understand that you know, massive quantitative easing on the scale we're seeing right now is going to have some kind of negative effect at some point, whether that's inflationary pressure going through the roof in the next few years or the sheer value of their money depreciating on a monthly basis. People have never really had to confront that in the last, in the last 10, 20 years um, well, at a macro level question globally. Interesting question in there that I'd like to posit. Um, have we genuinely seen thus far a pain point that the masses become aware outside of us in crypto that are using this as a champion point for us? Do we see enough of a pain point in quantitative easing for people in the general public to care? It's only beginning, in my view. What, what do you guys think? I, well, I think look, I think you have to look at what, what what are people investing in at the moment as an inflationary hedge. Not that many people buy gold. You know, Joe Public are not big holders of gold, and and you know, does Bitcoin event? Because that's the interesting point for me is in the world that we live in at the moment, the amount of quantitative easing that we're seeing it has to be inflationary. You know, if we're now talking about modern monetary theory and and literally handing out cash to Joe Public, if that isn't inflationary, I don't know what is. So so how do you protect against that? Well. Are enough people buying gold? I don't think so. If if the charts eventually say something along the lines of Bitcoin is outstripping gold as an inflationary hedge, then it gets really, really interesting. You know, then you might start to see some easily digestible financial products, you know, in a few years time that are linked to digital asset type situations, which, which you know, you have to package it to Joe Public in a, in a digestible way, which at the moment, you know, buying gold or bought, buying, buying gold bars, you know, gold ETFs are pretty much as easy as it gets, but that still assumes people invest in financial products. And you look at the stats for most Americans, you know, a lot of them still don't hold stocks, for example. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about it, um, I mean, you, you can make a strong argument that the only thoughts here. Um, I'm just going to uh, announce that we're going to open this up for Q&A. So anybody that has a question, please start typing in your uh, questions in the Zoom chat webinar. Uh, we'll address them one by one as they come through. Um, and now back over to you, Jesus. Apologies. I just wanted to announce this. Uh, I was wondering whether my mic was working at all. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, so if, if you think about it, the, you can make a strong argument that the only two tools that central banks use, uh, has used for, for decades is interest rates and quantitative risk. Like the, there is really nothing else. And in the long term, that combination just, I mean, it, it, you run out of options. It just doesn't work. Uh, so this, I don't know what else governments could do today. I mean, this is a very complicated situation, but I'm, what I'm, what I'm, pretty concerned about is that this level of printing for the countries that can do it is going to have a generational impact. I think one or two generations on it, it's just going to, you're going to see the effects of it. So I want to also add something to what Josh said. I mean, I actually echo uh, everything he said, and uh, also we are uh, walking in uncharted territory. So people are a little worried, I'm talking about retail, I'm not talking about hedge funds, I'm not talking about like uh, major fund managers. Actually, talking about normal people, average Joe, like uh, my mom, my uncle, me, people that uh, deal with everyday situation, they're a little bit worried about what's going on. And uh, I can tell you, uh, I'm not sure in other countries, I don't think in the United States at all, but there are even talks about in Italy that something could happen to banks, like the government to actually seize your money from uh, one day to the other. Actually, it happened already uh, in 1992. Uh, it could happen again. And uh, something that I want to say is that Bitcoin, uh, with Bitcoin would never happen. Like uh, you cannot confiscate Bitcoin, they are yours. I mean, of course, unless you have any exchanges. And uh, the fact that Bitcoin stands for freedom, that's something that resonates a lot in people nowadays. Like especially now that we're in, almost like in, in house jail, let me put it this way. Something like Bitcoin actually has, uh, I don't want to say sexiness, but it has a sort of appeal 
that other things don't have. And I think that should, uh, something that Bitcoin should uh, promote more. I mean, money is good, like uh, we talk about up and send down and everything else, but Bitcoin should go back to its root and say what it is and what it stands for. And it stands for freedom. And this is something that people understand. And uh, moving forward, next few years, uh, when there's gonna be more uh, uh, money flood in the market, when there's gonna be more risk in the markets, uh, if people remember that uh, the money is yours and it's always with you in your, fo in your phone, your wallet, in whatever, in your uh, uh, cold storage, I mean, like uh, that's something that uh, uh, is gonna be a major differentiator between Bitcoin cryptocurrencies and uh, fiat currency. I couldn't agree. So I'm going to turn it over to some of the questions that we're having in the chat here. The uh, first one I see that looks um, like an interesting one. Uh, what factors uh, should we consider in COVID? And I'm even going to throw a second piece in here, uh, the upcoming happening and what this impact could be on crypto mining facilities at scale. Does anybody have any insight? Yeah, here? yeah that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. It, Honestly, so I think uh, Vincenzo, you nailed it 100%. Is coming back to the philosophy of Bitcoin. So A stands for freedom, right? When it, so then you have to always think why you're actually embracing cryptocurrencies. So the technology is there. Actually, the blockchain technology is there. The token economy are there to incentivize the community to use it, right? So now is our job is our task that's why we're getting paid for to actually find out the ways in which the average joe every single person out there can actually cash out or cash in or use their assets this is our job this is our task so binance just came out with a visa card for example that's a perfect fiat right use and, and actually see the value of your assets then you have someone like camera uh promoting and liquidating these tokens so they gain the value so the chain keep promoting. So um, when it comes to mining, yeah, that's an aspect of the blockchain. After COVID and the halving, well, I can imagine that if in case, for example, of China, the CBDC, the China is rolling now, um, I think mining in China, for example, will definitely be out there in competition to actually uh, mine the Bitcoin and then transactions that the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin will achieve, um, I, think that, I think that's going to be a clog in the system. So therefore, for Bitcoin in this case, it might will be, uh, definitely will be an issue. However, you also have different kinds of technology within blockchain and different kinds of tokens that you can utilize. So I think the solutions are there. Again, mining for Bitcoin, sure, it will be a niche, but then you can just move forward another technology and just apply your tools over there. Think of Tezos, think of ontology. I mean, so you, you know. Have an interesting point just here. Um, uh, you had touched on a CBDC, central bank digital currencies, and I'm noticing here in the chat that we had somebody ask a question around this. Um, assuming modern economies start issuing digital tender, if you will, um, in the coming yeah. years, do we see an impact on BTC and crypto as a whole around this? Uh, for instance, is it well, a ramp or is it an industry killer? Yeah, well, in, by all means. I mean, for example, stable coins, they're only going to be able to stay alive and to be, you know, like you can use them as long as a CDBC and a government allows them to roll out, right? Because if for, for an average show, why will they use a stable coin if they can just use the digital euro, the digital dollar? Again, we always have to de ourselves, detach ourselves from our technical industry knowledge and go back and put ourselves in the shoes of the average person out there. So CDBC, yeah, that's, yeah, that's going to be a change for the industry. Now I see it as very positive. You know, the, the interest for blockchain, for the technology will be out there for decentralized identity, for fiat ramp is going to be out there for liquidity. So uh, I, I see it as a positive thing. I also think of Bitcoin and, and there is a generation of cryptocurrencies that are here to stay as an asset class and the use cases are way beyond payment. So stablecoin is a category that is definitely vulnerable to central banks uh, in, in some shape or form, but that's only one use, use case, right? It would be like saying that, you know, uh, the commodities are vulnerable to um to a new currency coming into the market. I think those asset classes are gonna evolve uh, independently into uh, based on certain properties and we're gonna see more derivative products and, and more uh, financial instruments 
created around it. And I think Bitcoin already proved how resilient uh, it is. So I, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think also, you know, you, you look at what the remit is for crypto. If you go back to Vincenzo's point, if this is something that fundamentally undermines, you know, the current monetary system, then stable coins, right, they might take a chunk out of the pie for the current stable coins that we have. But, you know, your crypto sits outside of, of that monetary system. So, you know, it becomes a rival to it. But I think it still serves the same purpose. You know, if you're not happy that your cash is being undermined by central bank policy, uh, you know, and you're putting you don't want to put your faith in the manipulation of interest rates and, and printing money and you'd rather put it into you know, what is essentially a mathematical code that is completely decentralized and can't be seized from you, you know, then it always has a place. Yeah, I actually align more to Cameron's school of thought here, where I do believe it is absolutely inevitable that we will see all large um, and predominant central banks in the world issue their own fiat digital currency. It won't be a stable coin, but it will be printed money that will be circulating. It will be used not predominantly in retail. Um, I actually think it will be used to set or inter, uh, settle interbank, um, in particular, overnight balances. Um, so it will be predominantly used on uh, overnight lending between uh, federal reserves, uh, central banks, and other banks that are required to meet their own liquidity reserves. However, I do think it will be some time before we start to see a digital currency rolled out in a retail perspective from a central bank, just because of the technological hurdles that would have to be overcome with this, which, of course, we definitely have the technology solutions available at our fingertips today, but what we do not have is the distribution means, nor do we have the pain point from a political perspective, I think, to have a genuine drive of adoption for this. Uh, so we actually had a pretty interesting question here that I do want to touch on. Um, does the recent liquidity drain set back the previous hope of crypto adoption from institutions? And do we continue to see crypto more of a retail-oriented uh, investment thesis, given what has transpired through COVID? Interesting question. Um, if I can talk from an exchange perspective, um, I think, you know, it has definitely... Uh, made people more aware especially on the institutional side that you know this as as, a, as an asset class that you can allocate to for longer periods of time may not be suitable at this moment in time um but it, what we haven't seen certainly at the exchange level is, is is an impact on the engagement that we have from our institutional client base and our, our what we call our, our kind of our corporate users um, we haven't seen any impact on that that's a negative impact. They, in fact, are more engaged with us right now in trying to understand what comes next. So um, I think it will, you know, the volatility um, has scared some institutions off, notably the more institutional ones, i.e. pension funds. It's simply not an asset that they would sit and hold on um, at this moment in time, bar a few um, that we've seen over the last six months. But I, I, I certainly don't see it having had a material impact on the appetite of, um, of institutional traders and investors to kind of get involved and, and build trading strategies around it. So as a speculative asset, uh, which is very much where a lot of institutional traders and investors come from, um, I haven't seen it uh, impact negatively uh, the desire to, to kind of continue being involved in this digital asset space. Yeah, I, I tend to agree when... Um when the, the, during those days of March 13, one of the evenings I received a text from uh, a hedge fund that I, I happen to be interested on. One of the managers sent me a text saying, uh, Bitcoin, the institutional market for crypto is, is done. Like it's just not going to happen in the next 10 years. So, and, and this is, so that's a, you know, a pretty uh, extreme. Uh, perspective, but I do think that it's going to take a lot for institutions to put money into uh, an asset that can drop 30% of its value uh, overnight. Granted, th that text was sent before Boeing dropped 30% of its value in a, <laughs> in a few hours, so it, it, we're seeing that, that sort of movement in, in mm. traditional equities uh, today. Um, but, but I think it's going to take a while. At, at the same token, I think there is a vibrant uh, market for traders and, and, and speculators and quant funds, and, and which are going to be the dominant form of funds in, in this market, uh, as well as retail. I mean, I think we were likely to see another retail boom in the next, uh, in the next few years. 
Uh, so we are currently now at what the end of this uh, panel discussion is supposed to be. I, however, don't really have anything else to do uh, the rest of the evening. I'll be sticking around a little bit longer if any of our guests and panelists would like to as well. Uh, definitely feel free to. Um, also, uh, before anybody signs off, please give a round of applause and a big thank you to our panelists. Um, it really was fantastic to have you here. I really appreciated your insights. Uh, I will be sticking around for a little bit more of a Q&A. If any of the other panelists want to stick around maybe for another 10 or 15 minutes to answer some questions, you're by, uh, by all means, of course, welcome. But if you have to drop off for any other calls or any other engagements, please uh, feel free to. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to stick around. I can see I've got 18% on my laptop and I'm not near a charger, so we'll, <laughs> so, we'll, we'll go okay. to guys. Right, just so we'll on that point, Cameron's laptop dies. <laughs> yeah. just, just on that, just before I go and close my long avocado position, I uh, I, I wanted to just mention that the the entry point for um, larger institutions into crypto, there, there's a slightly perverse uh, point that that I thought I might bring up that I'm I'm seeing in in parts. The the world has a thirst for dollars at the moment, and yes. if you're a, a fund and if you're a fund manager. Uh, and you see that you can build a crypto lending book that is yielding you, depending on what you're lending and the terms, that is yielding you anywhere between, say, 6, 7, sometimes 11%. It's, it will be slightly a bizarre situation where you'll find that the reason why non-crypto entities are entering crypto is to get their hands on US dollars. And I actually think that's going to be something that, that really continues to grow going forward. So we're actually seeing some interest in some of our planned investment products, particularly around that and how these uh, crypto assets could be used for liquidity to inevitably be uh, transferred into fiat currency. And actually piggybacking off of this, I want to ask, uh, frankly, I think what my favorite question so far in that chat is. Given what we saw, uh, what transpired on March 13th, where institutional investors liquidated uh, probably their Bitcoin uh, positions first, and then moving forward into institutional adoption of crypto, did this massive downturn that we saw, and let's just even keep it on Bitcoin for the time being, did that extinguish any hope we have of a Bitcoin ETF in the near future? And I'll actually uh, caveat it with this. Think about it from the perspective of the stock exchange. During that period of time, if there was a Bitcoin ETF trading on March 13th, it is very likely that it would have been shut off with the rest of that stock exchange as soon as the 7% circuit breaker went into play, therefore disadvantaging any investors in the Bitcoin ETF relative to Bitcoin continuing to plummet. Well, the, the thing is, you look at a situation like that, can you imagine... Uh, the gapping on open every time. Unbelievable, uh, you know, yeah. It, it would be an untradable product, you know, considering the, what the underlying is doing, you know, every time that that opens, you know, you're, the, gaps, the gaps are going to be laughable. So that, that almost makes it a non-starter. You know, the, the, the reason ETFs work is that for the most part, you know, the underlying market is either based on the stock market or, uh, you know, soft or hard commodities that don't move around as much as crypto. I think what's more likely to happen is crypto will have to become a far more mature market. Then you'll find those additional products proliferate. But, but at the moment, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And if I'm honest, I, I would be surprised if you saw enough participants want to put those together. There's a few out there at the moment. But, but, you know, I don't see there being a huge competition in terms of, uh, of providers. Yeah, I think just from, 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 our, from our side, we're seeing pretty much the same. You know, in Europe, we have um, ETPs, exchange traded products uh, or exchange traded notes already in existence. We've seen the, the market cap of those rise and fall, um, along with the sentiment in the crypto markets. But I think the, the US regulator has a much dimmer view of, of the integrity of the crypto market overall. And, and because of that, and because of probably what we saw in March, it's, it's definitely less likely that a, uh, a regulator in the US is going to budge on, on whether or not an ETF is appropriate right now. Um, I think in a way it's, it's uh, sad um, to see, to, 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 to realize that because you know, it, it would certainly have opened up um, an, an interesting channel for new investors to come in. But the structural issues with the crypto market make it very difficult to reconcile that kind of, you know, rosy view that we'd like to have against the reality of, of, of the market working the way it works. Um, and, and that's just the reality of, 
of having a Bitcoin underlying match to an ETF product. So I think in the next six months, depending on what the markets do, we'll, we'll be able to probably reassess where the regulator's appetite will be. But I think at the moment, based on, on what happened in March, it's going to be a really hard sell for them. Yeah, okay, I mean, so something. Oh, go ahead, uh, no, Andrew, please. From, from my point of view, on the retail side, uh, people only care about ETN or ETF just because of tax reasons. Because if they want to buy and sell, there is uh, clear regulations and say capital gains or capital losses. Otherwise, they would stick with Bitcoin as Bitcoin. They wouldn't go to like an ETF or an ETN. They would be like a bastardization of crypto. What I know, but I'd like also to follow up on something that you mentioned, Patrick, on the CDBC, the Central Bank Digital Currencies. I said I strongly believe they are going to happen uh, sooner than later. And the catalyzer is going to be Libra if it launches. If Libra launches, and again, it's a big if, that's going to be like the reason why central banks need to like launch their currencies as soon as possible. And I guess everybody knows that the bank, the central bank of France, has already started like applications for um, uh, application for uh, a cent for a euro coin. Uh, central bank of China, they say that they have their coin done, and other banks and other central banks are working on it. They're going to work even faster if Libra launches. And if that happens, so then again, I know it's a big if, people are going to know, like normal people, I'm not talking about fund managers, I'm talking about the average or like uh, everyday, everyday people, they're going to know what a crypto is. I know it's a bastardization crypto, don't get me wrong, it's not as mm -hmm. Bitcoin, but at least they are going to be able to be introduced to the crypto space. They're not going to know what, let's say, private keys, which by the way, most people don't know right now. They're going to understand what happens if they lose the private key. And at that point, there's going to be education among people. And the next step would be, okay, yes, I mean, everything, like, everything works. I mean, what can I do now? You can buy Bitcoin or you can buy their cryptocurrency, something that is, uh, has more value. Almost like whenever you have a pennies and you want to buy uh, gold coins, that's going to be the same. Like the penny coins, the nickel coins are going to be like the euro coin, the US dollar coin, while the gold coin is going to be Bitcoin. I mean, I believe this is going to happen like uh, within the next two or three years. So, I mean, we're not too far away from it. If Libra launches, because that's going to be like the main catalyzer, because they have all the reach, they have all the customers, they have all the merchants, yeah. it's going to be easier for them to do it. And, and yeah, that I, is a I, very I, big I, if. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I have to plug in there since uh, we as a protocol, we are talking to uh, the Libra Foundation. We're talking to Celo which by the way, keep in, name, uh, keep in mind that name, Celo, they're building a, a great infrastructure. I would say even a competition to, to Libra, um, also US uh, uh, based uh, project. And we're, we're in talks with them to build a decentralized identity solution that they, are, that they require. For an ETF and ETN, I agree with you. I think this is, this, uh, it might not be the time, but again, you're trying to plug in crypto to the establish to the to the to the to the regulated heavy regulated well-established uh ecosystem so when vincenzo mentions that sure if uh, the regular joe wants to um, adopt etf and etn based on crypto sure it's going to be the tax uh connotation that that goes into it right so we're trying again to plug in these two worlds which are very very different and i think the learning after covid and after all the madness that is around is this. We have to start treating both ecosystems differently and learn from each one of them and see how they can plug it efficiently and on a very smart way. Um, I think this is going to be ETF more of your task, note. Josh. Uh, uh, but, so on, yeah. on the ETF note, somebody in the chat asked a very, very interesting question that I frankly don't know the answer to and I'm hoping maybe one of you do. Um, I mean, we made the point earlier about how if the circuit breaker would be triggered um, if Bitcoin drops significantly. So someone asked the question, were crude ETFs suspended given um, what transpired between Saudi Arabia and Russia, which effectively plummeted the price of uh, crude oil 20, 30 percent? Does anybody have an answer to that? Because I frankly don't. If not, I'm going to have to go look this up. Can you, can you repeat that one, Patrick? So uh, basically the same phenomenon happened in commodities. <clears throat> um, so a few weeks ago, uh, the Saudi Arabians, <clears throat> no, sorry, 
the Saudi Arabians and the Russians were not able to come to an arrangement on oil, and basically the Saudis decided to yeah. flood the marketplace. Uh, what happened is that the price of oil absolutely plummeted, and basically it's a way yeah. for the Saudis to try to squeeze out uh, the Russians and the Americans in the oil manufacturing game, crude oil in particular. Uh, crude dropped 20 30%. Does anybody know if the ETFs tracking crude also dropped 20, 30% or how those were handled? I'm not sure about the ETF uh, themselves because those ETFs are, are well composed to, to not have exposure to, uh, to, to a single thing. But during that day, it was the beginning of March, uh, when oil futures dropped to one of the lowest times in, in years, there were a lot of halts uh, during the day, including some, uh, some other stocks that had exposure to oil. It was like uh, seven or eight halts in the morning on the New York Stock Exchange. It, it was a nonstop thing as a reaction to, to oil prices. So it does happen. Yeah. So we had... Uh, you have to... You, oh, sorry, sorry you, ahead, you have seen that you have seen that phenomenon already in a country like Venezuela. So the it was actually not, it was not Saudi Arabia properly. It was Saudi Arabia using the OPEC, which is the organization of countries that regulate the the crude oil. Um, yes. But but you have seen that example uh, already several times in Venezuela. Um, the the crude oil price for the Venezuelan oil has decreased in value due to the high and the corruption in the country, yet the trade of, for example, ETF vehicles within the country has exploded dramatically, right? So um, in all honesty, uh, whether these went down 20 or 30 percent, yeah, sure, it might be the case for now, because again, it's an organization as the OPEC and it has a global impact. The question will be, how was an ETF based on crude oil traded that day in Saudi Arabia itself. So you have to then analyze the data from Saudi Arabia and not mm. as a crude oil in the, in the stock exchange in New York. Uh, but you have seen this phenomenon already in Venezuela several, several times. And it has always, since there is Bitcoin in the country, been quite positive for cryptocurrencies as a means of scape and safety. So uh, it depends how you want to see it. Ah, perfect. So I'm going to actually end on this question before going into a sign off. Um, it's very, very open ended and it's go it could be potentially difficult to answer. But why would Libra not launch? I believe Libra what? wants to launch. Like uh, there is no reason why they would not want to launch. Is The question is if they allow it to launch or not. I mean, my opinion, I mean, they, uh, even Zuckerberg puts, put his face in Libra. I mean, for me, it would yeah. be like uh, a major like uh, blow to his even, uh, I mean, name if Libra doesn't launch. Mm. It would yeah. be an absolute I, blow not only to him, but Facebook. I absolutely agree. Uh, yeah. I, I do believe that the only reason it doesn't go off will be if governments and regulators and compliance officers around the world unify to stop uh, Libra from going live. Yeah, I think the one thing that we all should bear in mind is, is if it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, it, it, it's just as much their fault as it is the government or, or regulators speaking up. Why do I say that? If you look at the initial bill that they leaked to the market themselves, where they said, we're going to create this basket of assets, and this basket of assets is going to back uh, this, this coin, this asset, this token that we're going to release to our user base. That looks, that feels, that smells like a regulated instrument. So I'm not entirely sure who their advisors were when they were putting that together, uh, but they immediately rang all the red flags, all the bells and whistles that you would expect to, to sound when you start saying that you're going to release a regulated instrument to millions and millions of retail users through a social media app. So in a way they made their own bed. So now it's all on them to figure it out and create something very simple, very clean, that perhaps is just a basket of currencies only that represents perhaps electronic money or, or some kind of uh, electronic money instrument. Um, so, so I think they kind of, they shot themselves in the foot a little bit by getting a little bit too, too smart and complicated in the beginning when they should have taken a very simple risk measured approach to it and say, this is a very simple product we're bringing. This is how it works. There we go.
Well, they certainly were a bit grandiose in the rollout of Libra, and I certainly think that that ended up coming back to bite them in the ass a little bit. Um, yeah. I also think that their choice of Switzerland as a domicile, while all of us are very familiar uh, working in Switzerland, I think a lot of us probably have legal entities or certain lawyer groups in crypto working for us in Switzerland. I think we would agree that although on a global scale, politicians are wary whenever anything financial comes in and out of Switzerland, particularly out of the rest of Europe and the United States. So that throws up an even further red flag. And I kind of resemble your uh, sentiment, Josh, that if something looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, very likely it's a duck. And in this case, I'm not unconvinced that Libra in its initial construction uh, looks and feels an awful lot like a security. In fact, it actually looks and feels a lot like an ETF at the end of the day to a certain extent. It's a, it's a, it's a currency-based ETF to, uh, from my yeah. opinion. Um, a Zeus. It's been interesting to see how Libra's kind of pivoted a little bit, and there's even some rumors that Libra will potentially just go purely USD-backed or have a large allocation to USD. Are you seeing things relatively similar? Or what are your thoughts you have here? I think uh, to, to for the first point, I, I think Facebook is prepared to fight these regulators for a long time. So I think chances are that is that is going to launch the the USD uh, change. I my personal opinion is that the initial basket of currencies in the proposal was a bit of a rookie mistake. I think that made it too complicated and then too yeah. easy to be attacked for many angles. So just tying it to a single currency makes it uh, way, uh, way better. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's just a personal opinion, but, but I think it, it makes sense to start with a simpler model. Yes, I absolutely agree as well. Um, so I'm actually going to close us down here. I really appreciate everybody coming out for the panel. I really appreciate all of our panelists as well. We certainly had some uh, insightful views here. I'm going to go through one last kind of uh, go round uh, the merry-go-round as to what our outlooks are in 2020. And I'll start with you, Jesus. Uh, what do we think will be... Uh, how will we look back five years from now and view this period from a crypto perspective? Uh, I'm horrible making predictions. So if you do the opposite <laughs> of what I'm telling you, you're probably going to do well. But uh, um, I think at a macro perspective, it might be, this might be one of the years that, that consolidates a narrative and the value proposition for Bitcoin in particular. I, and I also think, in the in the current market ecosystem as nascent as it is uh the, this crisis is going to differentiate very good companies from mediocre uh companies so we're mm -hmm. already seeing some exchanges like binance distant themselves from the pack and, and i think we're going to see more of that across different segments of the of the market so at the at the end at the other side of this the, the composition of the crypto market might look more high quality and a little bit different than what we're seeing today Vincenzo, yeah, what, I mean, uh, what are your outlook? Yeah, I agree with you, Jesus, uh, on the quality of companies that are going to survive. Uh, the work in the desert, uh, I mean, after this crisis, uh, only the best companies are going to survive, uh, and we're going to have, uh, like, the best of the best and more quality to the customers. I totally agree with that. But if you look five years from today, and we go back, like, let's say we're in 2025, and we say, wow, let's see what happened in 2020, we're going to think, wow, that was a year of great opportunity. And yes. uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure that people are going to look back and say, wow, why didn't I, didn't I buy Bitcoin? Or why didn't I get into this space? Or why didn't I start the company in this space? Because I mean, things are going to progress. I mean, uh, we're gonna, this is going to be the currency and the, the groundwork of the future. So I'm very bullish. Like, I mean, I spent already, like, I mean, I'm very bullish by, by definition because I invested five, six years of my life in uh, cryptocurrency space. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be the for next 10, 20, 30 years, like people who are born today, they're not going to look at piece of papers as uh, like the currency. They're going to look at the cryptocurrency as the real way of money, how the way you make payments, uh, the way you send money to somebody else in the world, and the way you accumulate uh, wealth. So I'm very bullish.
Yes, I couldn't agree more. And I definitely think that like in crypto winter, only the strong were able to come out of this coming out. They're coming out of that crisis. I do think that coming out of this crisis, only the strongest companies will be survived or bought by our good friends at Binance. Um, obviously, you guys had recently purchased coin market cap. So maybe you can touch on real briefly what your plans are or what was the strategic thinking around that at a high level before we sign off here. Yeah, sure. I think just sharing the same sentiment with, with everyone on the panel that, you know, we're really bullish about the future. Um, we're a company that's three years old, so we're very young. We're learning a lot. Um, and as an industry, we're, we're very much still at the early stage. Uh, and I think everyone, everyone needs to take a step back sometimes and, and, and just pat themselves on the back for still being here after the, the peaks and troughs we've seen uh, in the market, you know we're at a very early stage. So whilst I wouldn't even dream of trying to predict where we're gonna be in five years, because you know, six months, let alone a year in, in, in the crypto space is, is five, six years in the traditional space. So yeah. um, I, I won't try and predict, but you know, at Binance, we're, we're very, very bullish for the future. We're continuing to build. We're actively hiring, um, which is going against the grain of other uh, traditional uh, companies uh, in, in, in other sectors. We're hiring actively. Uh, we're looking to scale our team up globally uh, in as many jurisdictions as possible because we very much believe we're creating a fundamental solid base for growth for the future. And if we're the early adopters, if we're the early pioneers in, in, in services and products in this space, well, it'll pay dividends in the future. Um, so, you know, talking to uh, the, the, the CMC deal, the coin market cap acquisition um, that you saw recently, well, for us, data is everything and and you know we we think that having transparent fair um and, and accurate market data is one of the most important things that we can um try and encourage um as a kind of a fundamental of the industry so bringing them into the binance family was was a real key key strategy for us and cementing a a really a really you know grade a tier one data provider and and, and Kind of market information provider. So the key fundamental for us is they're, they're very much segregated from us. They're their own entity. They are, are, are you know, very much on the other side of a Chinese wall, should we say, um, and they're autonomous running their own business. But as a portfolio um, company of ours, it made a perfect sense for us to acquire a, a team with that depth of understanding of the market so we can, you know, help the market grow, help the transparency and quality of data just really ramp up as the market itself, we believe, ramps up over the next couple of years. Oh, that sounds absolutely fantastic. So I really appreciate it, everybody. We are now going to be drawing to a close. Um, I apologize that we weren't able to do these bar in the blocks in person. Of course, given current market circumstances, I think everybody can understand. Uh, what we are going to do from here, from Iconic's perspective, is we are going to be making these bar on the block events bi-weekly. Um, so I might be inviting some of the current guests that we have back, and we already have our next event planned uh, with actually all of the speakers that were going to be participating from the New York panel that we ended up and, and having anyway, but not really. Uh, so we will be having that event two Thursdays from now on Thursday, uh, the 23rd of April, we will be having Tom Lee from Fundstrat as well as representatives from Fidelity and Genesis Trading participating in our next panel. Uh, in addition to that, Iconic will also be rolling out a web series, a uh, chat, if you will, between myself and various individuals, where we'll have high-level conversations related to traditional finance and crypto and hopefully have a little bit of fun as well. Um, I'm certainly going to be inviting every one of our panelists from uh, this conversation to be joining me on those web chat series as well. And I look forward to uh, hopefully engaging with all of you guys in the very, very near future at one of our in-person bar on the block events. I wish you all a very good day. Stay healthy, stay safe out there. All the best to you and your families. And thank you once again for joining us for our first digital bar on the block. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. See you everyone. Cheers. Bye.